Hello, and tonight we're going to be discussing Thrive at Any Age, um, Health Strategies for Aging Gracefully. So here I just have a quote um, by Sir Isaac Newton, a body in motion stays in motion. So this is just basically going to be the theme for tonight's talk. Right, so these are the objectives for tonight. So first, I'm just gonna discuss the effects of aging on our bodies. Um, the main focus is gonna be on muscles, bones, and joints, just because primarily as physical therapists, that's what we treat. Um, I'm gonna also discuss ways that we can slow some of this um, degeneration on our joints. Um, and then lastly, I'm gonna talk about how physical therapy can help. All right, so first we're gonna get into the aging process. Okay, so there are some factors that do affect uh, the aging process. Some of them we kind of have some control over, some of them we do not. So first we have um, genetics up here that obviously um, we do not have any control over uh, our genetic makeup. So some people do have a certain predisp predisposition um, to develop certain illnesses or syndromes. Um, you know, it may put you at risk for developing osteoarthritis, things like that. So we don't have control over our genetics. Um, next up here, we have environment um, that, you know, we can kind of control to some extent, like, you know, not having excess of UV lights. So trying to stay out of the sun too much that can help, um, but also like pollution, depending on where you live, some of that can affect it as well. Um, Lifestyle that we can definitely control, um, you know, getting proper nutrition, the right amount of sleep, um, exercise, all of that can help trying to um, avoid smoking and drinking that can all help with um, aging. And then psychological. So some of that you can control too by stress management. Um, stress can affect aging as well. So, you know, trying to utilize some good techniques like meditation or grounding, some of that can um, help as well. Right. So this slide here has a ton of information on it. But this is going over all of the physiological effects um, of aging. So it affects many of the systems on our body. Um, so some of these we'll go into more detail about. Uh, I won't get into discussion about all of them. Um, the nervous system, that I won't really talk about, but I will um, touch base on that a little bit. So as you see here, it does say that there's um, a reduction in our proprioception. So proprioception is our body's awareness in space. Um, so that can help, that can affect balance, uh, which puts you at risk for falls. So we will talk about that later on in the slide. Um, it also, our nervous system, we do have a reduction or uh, diminished reflexes and kind of our coordination starts to get less coordinated as we get older. And then that can um, affect balance as well. Um, integumentary system, we won't really talk about that. That's our um, skin, hair, and nails. Obviously our hair, we start to get gray hair. Um, our skin, we lose the elasticity in our skin um, and the nails can become brittle. Immune system, um, you know, obviously that becomes weakened as we get older. Uh, cardiovascular system is affected. Um, you know, some of the blood vessels can be, the walls can become thickened. So our cardiovascular system has to work harder. Um, so this, you know, keeping up aerobic exercise that can help maintain this. Um, endocrine system, we do have a reduction in hormones. 
um, our estrogen in females starts to decrease, testosterone in males will start to decrease uh, body composition. Um, we will start to accumulate a little more fat versus muscle as we age. Um, also respiratory system, um, this starts to, this is also affected. Um, again, aerobic exercise can help um, maintain that function. Uh, skeletal muscle, this we will definitely talk about. Um, we'll get into more detail about that, about how we do le lose our muscle mass as we age. Um, digestive system, um, we do have reduced digestion and lack of absorption of nutrients. Um, urinary system, that's also affected. And then uh, the skeletal, um, skeletal system. So we do get a reduction in bone density as we age and our joints can also become arthritic with age. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. We're gonna focus more on the um, skeletal system and the musculoskeletal system. Also some more effects of aging, um, it does cause some mobility changes. Uh, some sensory changes too. So sometimes our nerves are affected. So if somebody has diabetes, they may end up with peripheral um, neuropathies. So like they may lose the feeling in their feet. Um, also, if somebody has gone through chemotherapy, they may develop neuropathy from that. Um, there's also vision changes. Uh, we lose um, our vision becomes decreased, um, and then also hearing loss. All right, so the next section here is where we're gonna focus on our muscles, um, bones, and joints. So over here, I just have a picture. We have the bones, which in between the bones, you have your joints, which is how the bones will move. Um, and then the muscles, which give our bones support. Um, the tendons attach the muscles to the bones, and then that's what gives them support and allows for movement. So as I said, as we do get older, we lose our muscle mass, which is referred to as sarcopenia. Um, this actually begins happening at the age of 30. So once you hit 30, you start to lose that muscle mass. It's harder to gain the muscle too. Um, you may notice weakness, um, which then can lead to some difficulty in walking and can also lead to decreased balance. Um, I won't get into detail, too much detail with this, but this is just um, a picture of a muscle so this is the tendon that attaches the muscle to the bone. All of our muscle is wrapped around with fascia, which you might hear that term sometimes. Um, sometimes people will have like myofascial pain. It can be like restricted or tight. Um, so sometimes, you know, there's different myofascial techniques that we can use as therapists to help release that tension. That's this little thin tissue that surrounds the muscle. Um, then these are just the layers of the muscle here. And then this is going into detail um, of one of the fibers here and then the plasma wall and then um, some blood capillaries in there as well. Um, next, we're gonna talk about bone density. So this is something that also decreases as we age. Um, so, there's osteopenia, which is kind of like the beginning stages of bone loss. This is where the bones um, don't have enough minerals and they become weakened. If you leave it untreated, it will develop into osteoporosis. Um, and then that is where the body is having difficulty to make new bone to keep up with the loss of bone. Um, the bones then will become brittle and weak, and it puts people at risk for fractures. Um, so some of the risk factors are that females are at greater risk than males, um, somebody that has low body weight, uh, family history. I also don't have it mentioned on here, but ethnicity also plays a role. So people from European descent are more at risk. Um, medications too. So somebody who's been on corticosteroids like prednisone, 
that can put them at risk for um, developing osteoporosis. And then also lifestyle. So if you drink a lot of coffee, um, caffeine has been linked to um, putting people at risk for osteoporosis. Um, also alcohol and smoking, all of that can put you at risk for osteoporosis. So this is a healthy bone. You can see how it's all filled in here. And then this is somebody with osteoporosis where you can see how the bone is very thin. It's almost like holes that are through the bone. So then since the bone's weak, if you fall, um, you know, it would put you at risk for developing a fracture. And here we're going to talk about um, some joint degeneration. So that's also something that our joints are affected as we age. Um, so joint degeneration, which is also called osteoarthritis. So some people get confused between osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Um, so rheumatoid arthritis is more of an autoimmune issue where you would get blood work done to be diagnosed with that. Rheumatoid typically affects um, joints on both sides of the body. Um, osteoarthritis, I mean, it can affect both sides, but you know, one side might be worse than the other. Um, so osteo is more of that wear and tear on the joint, those degenerative changes. It's also, you may see it referred to as DJD. So there are some causes. So if you've had an injury in the past, it can put you at risk for developing arthritis in that joint. Um, age, as we get older, we're at risk for developing arthritis. And then sometimes genetics too can um, put you at risk for developing it. And some of the symptoms are pain and you'll notice um, a lot of stiffness in the joint. So this is a healthy joint here. This is a knee joint. So you have your femur, which is your thigh bone up top. Then here is your tibia, which is your shin bone. And then your fibula over here. So here you can see where the articular cartilage is covering um, that knee joint very nicely. In between these two bones, these little circular pieces of cartilage, that is, those are your meniscus. Um, so a lot of times you'll hear people will tear the meniscus. These act like shock absorbers in the um, knee joint. So with degeneration and arthritis, this is a picture over here of that, where you can see that there's all these bone spurs. Those are those bumps that are along the joint. Um, here you can see the cartilage, how it's all worn away. And then um, lastly, you can see here that there's a lot of narrowing of that joint space. So, um, you know, we'll get into some of the preventative um, things to try to help, um, you know, avoid this or help slow the process of that. But um, you can see this joint here has a lot, you know, it's very narrow. And then this one has that nice space there. All right. We'll go. So all of this also with age, it kind of all goes together, but it does impact people's balance as well. Um, that gets worse with age and that can be due to some muscle weakness. So we need strong muscles to support us when we're trying to balance. Um, like I mentioned earlier, nerve damage, that can also um, affect balance. So if you are lacking feeling um, on your feet, it's hard to know, you know, it's hard to balance because you can't feel the surface. Um, decreased coordination, that can also um, affect balance. And if you're gonna fall, it's kind of hard to stop a fall. Um, vision changes too. So balance kind of relies on um, our vision, our sensory, well, you know, how we're feeling the surface. And then also our vestibular system, which I didn't put in here, but that also um, our vestibular system is in our inner ear and that also decreases with age. Um, so sometimes people will start to develop vertigo, which vertigo is defined as the room spinning. So 
There's also people will get dizzy or lightheaded, but um, vertigo is defined as the room spinning. So there's many causes uh, for vertigo, but that can also um, happen as we age and then that can also affect balance. Um, when somebody is at risk for falls, it can cause fractures, head injuries, and then these people do become less confident um, because they're afraid that they're gonna fall again. And then this may make them less active, which then can lead to other illnesses. All right, so then the next topic that we're gonna get into is um, prevention and kind of how to slow down um, some of these processes. And we'll talk about exercise and supplements and things like that. All right, so for muscle loss, one of the biggest things is you wanna do resistive training, which that can consist of um, using, that can consist of um, using TheraBands, um, body weight, uh, dumbbells, kettlebells, um, barbells, all of that. So basically resistive training just means you're putting tension through the, um, through the muscle to help get it sh strengthened. Um, the American Medical Association, they, oops, to go that way. they recommend, um, strength training to be, uh, two to three times a week. And also along with 150 minutes of aerobic exercise, which sounds like a lot, but if you break it down and just do like 30 minute, like a 30 minute walk five days a week, along with um, a couple times a week doing some strength training, then you're covering your bases for that. And that'll help slow the process of losing muscle mass. Um, now, bone loss, similar to that, again, strength training is very important. So as you remember from that slide, I showed you very early on with the skeleton, our muscles support our bones. So they can help keep our bones nice and strong if we have strong muscles. So again, that um, strength training, resistive training is very, very important for bone loss. Um, also weight bearing exercises have been shown to be effective for, um, bone loss. So over here on the side, um, I have a picture where I'm showing just examples of weight bearing exercise. So there's two different versions. You can do low impact or, um, high impact. So definitely high impact is going to be for somebody who's, um, younger and already exercising, um, so I would definitely stick to the low impact, like walking, whether it's outside or on a treadmill, um, you know, an elliptical, things like that. But weight bearing does help um, slow bone loss because putting stress through the bone can actually help the body lay down more bone in that area. So um, weight bearing is definitely beneficial to help with that. All right, and then we're gonna talk about joint health. So I'm sure many of you have heard the term that motion is lotion, which is definitely true. So keeping your joints moving um, will help increase that synovial fluid, which we naturally have surrounding the joints and it acts as a lubricant for the joint. So that can help prevent stiffness and um, will help loosen it up. So I have a picture here of people riding bikes. Um, this is no impact. So this wouldn't necessarily be the best thing for osteoporosis, but it's wonderful for joint health um, for your knees because it's no impact. And that repetitive motion of the knees will increase the production of synovial fluid around the joint. Um, I also have on here glucosamine chondroitin. Um, studies show they're not sure if that really, um, helps, you know, a lot, it can help prevent damage, but it doesn't help the wear and tear that's already there. So once you have that arthritis in the joint, it's pretty much there, um, unless you were to get a joint replacement, 
But um, the glucosamine chondroitin, you know, it's an over-the-counter supplement that can help. Uh, you definitely want to check with your doctor first before taking it. Um, some people, some of it does have like shellfish in it. So if you have allergies, um, if you have diabetes, sometimes it can affect um, your blood glucose levels. So, you know, you would want to check with your doctor before taking any supplements. But, you know, it can help to kind of slow down the process. It's not really going to fix the wear and tear that's already there. Um, and then also trying to maintain a healthy weight. Um, that is very important. So they've done studies that show that um, the stress that goes through your joint, like your knee joint, is four times um, the weight of your body. So let's say a person is 10 pounds overweight. That would be like 40 extra pounds going through the knee joint. So that's why also exercise is important to try to maintain a healthy weight so you're not putting too much stress through the joints. Um, so nutrition, I won't talk a lot about this. Um, you know, as a physical therapist, this is kind of out of our realm, but you know, there are simple things that you do want to do. Um, protein, increasing protein can help support um, muscle. So you want to try to aim for 30 grams of protein each meal. And that can definitely help um, maintain your muscle mass. Also increasing calcium intake. This is very important for our bone health. Um, so you do want to try to have calcium for that. Uh, vitamin D also that can help for bone health. So whether you're taking uh, supplements, again, definitely check with your doctor. Um, a lot of people will have blood work done and it'll show that they're um, deficient in vitamin D and their doctor will recommend taking that. Um, also just sunlight, um, you know, not sitting out in the sun for a long time and making sure that you're wear still wearing sunscreen. But, you know, getting some sunlight every day can also help with um, our body's production of vitamin D. All right. So the last so section that we're going to discuss is how physical therapy can help with all of this. So as you know, I discussed how for muscles and bones and joints, exercise is very important. So that is um, what physical therapists are excellent at, is exercise prescription. So when we see a patient, we will base their treatment off of each patient's individual goals, whether that may be they want to get back to gardening or they want to be able to pick up their grandchild again. Um, you know, we will determine exercises that will achieve those goals. We also will dose exercises correctly too, which is very important. Um, you know, some people will just start exercising and they have no clue how many reps to do or how many sets to do. Um, so as a physical therapist, we're very good at dosing exercise correctly. So sometimes somebody may do, be doing something and it's causing them pain. And it's not necessarily that the exercise is wrong, it's that it's being dosed incorrectly. Um, so one of the things that we use and you may see in our clinics is the Borg um, RPE scale, rating of perceived exertion. So when you're exercising, you know, you don't want it to be really hard, but you also don't want it to be like super easy where you feel like you're not doing anything. You want it to be a little bit of a challenge, but you do want to be able to complete those 12 reps or 15 reps, whatever, you know, you're doing of that exercise. So, you know, you want to be able to complete the reps, but definitely have some challenge. Also, something else that we do is during a session, we're monitoring a patient's vitals. Um, you know, I always like to do it at rest and then, you know, during the treatment too, just to see how they're responding. So we can, you know, we'll determine target heart rate, and see where you should be exercising at. So, um, you know, you wanna kind of be in that moderate zone. So like 50 to 70%. So 
you want to find your max heart rate is always 220 minus your age. And that is your max heart rate that you do not want to go over, but you don't even really want to be like right near max heart rate. You really want to be 50 to 70% of that when you're exercising. So those are all things that if you see a physical therapist, they can help you with. Um, so sorry about that. Next, we're just going to talk about um, the role of physical therapy. So again, when you come in, um, if somebody is having an issue with balance, we'll do some of these standardized tests with them. So we'll definitely do a personalized assessment. Like I said, figure out what the goal is. Um, and then some of the tests that I like to use are the five times sit to stand. So here's a picture of a woman doing that test. So we would just time the patient and ask them to stand up and sit down five times and see how long it takes them to do that. Um, so there are like age-related norms for that. Um, but if somebody is taking too long to do that test, test that shows us that they are at risk for falls. Um, another one is the timed up and go, which is this picture right here. So it's another time test where we'll ask the patient to stand up and then walk 10 feet, turn around, come back and sit back down. And then we'll see how long that takes them. Again, the longer it takes them, the more they are at risk for falls. Um, manual muscle testing, we'll do that just to get an idea of um, the patient's strength because, again, strength is important for balance. So if there's weakness, um, that can affect their balance. Range of motion, too, is important. If somebody is, like, really stiff and lacking mobility, um, you know, they may not be able to get around better or recover if they're going to fall. And then balance testing, too. So we'll have them stand, you know, maybe stand in a um, tandem stance where one foot is in front of the other and balance, see how long they can stand there or see if they're able to stand on one foot. Um, sometimes we'll close the eyes or have them stand on a foam pad too, just to challenge it some more to, um, you know, see how their balance is and then to be able to determine what exercises they need to do. Um, we also, as PTs, are good at progressing exercises appropriately. So that's another thing. Um, you don't want to just continue doing the same exercises because our bodies will adapt. Um, and then we're not, you know, applying the appropriate stress to challenge our bodies to get us stronger. So um, if you're going to therapy, we'll definitely progress the exercises. Um, we will include balance activities, which will help prevent falls. And, you know, as a physical therapist, another thing that is great, you know, some people will say, well, I could just go see my personal trainer at the gym. But as a PT, you know, we're doing a thorough medical history review and taking into consideration previous injuries and surgeries. Um, so sometimes things need to be modified for patients so they're not re-injuring themselves or aggravating, um, you know, a previous injury. Another big thing is patient education. So, you know, we'll discuss ways to prevent falls. Uh, we'll talk about the house and, you know, telling them that you want to always remove throw rugs, um, any clutter so you're not tripping, um, also, if you use a nightlight when you get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, that can be beneficial. Um, I also always tell people, too, to try to, when you first get up, sit at the side of your bed, wait a minute, um, just to make sure you're not lightheaded, dizzy, and then stand up, still wait a minute, make sure you're okay before you take off to go to the bathroom. I mean, I know sometimes people have to get up and go right away, but you do want to try to do that to make sure that you're safe. Um, and then also, I know nobody ever wants to use an assistive device, um, but sometimes it is necessary to make the patient safe. Um, so if you're at physical therapy, um, they can definitely make the appropriate recommendations on which device to use. 
Um, and we can also direct the patient of where to go to um, obtain a, an assistive device. And we can also properly measure it too. Um, so typically if you're standing, you want the handle of either the walker or the cane to come um, down right to like your palm or crease. So if your arms are just hanging at your side naturally and relaxed, and they go alongside of the handles here, you, the handle should come right about here. So that way when you're walking, there's a slight bend in the elbow, that they're not too straight, um, that you're not leaning forward too much, not too hunched over, um, or that it's not too high and your shoulders aren't up to your ears. So um, that's just some helpful um, things. I know nobody ever really likes to get an assistive device, but sometimes it does become necessary.